Hello, my name is Alan Walsham. I'm a teacher of English and North American culture at Hokkaido Bunkyo University in Eniwa, Hokkaido in Japan. And today I'm going to talk about an ESL practice uh, that uses television programs for teaching. First, I'm going to talk kind of about some of the things that have been written about this already. And uh, after that, I'm going to tell some of the techniques I use in my class. None of this is earth-shattering, groundbreaking. It's sort of basic background information, but those of you who don't use TV in the classroom may not know how useful it is, how well it works, and how much students can learn from it. Okay, I'm going to read a section of the paper. Uh, please look at the actual paper itself if you would like, but if you prefer listening, this is a good way to do it. Okay. So findings in recent years have generally been positive about learning from TV. And there's a guy named Stuart Webb. He's kind of the champion of this field. Some of his articles and books are some of the best things in the field. But uh, he works with a lot of other people. And Webb and Peters in 2020 assure us that research shows that students are motivated to learn language through watching foreign language television programs, so, end quote. But they go on to point out that and quote again, surprisingly, television has played a relatively small role in the language learning classroom, end quotes. Even though findings show that, quote, students learn new words and phrases through watching television, and the amount of learning may be similar to what is learned through reading. That's the key point we'll come back to. The final point here may be similar to what is learned through reading is startling, and if true, should greatly change the way many of us teach and learn language. The vast majority of learners prefer watching television to reading books, especially textbooks and vocabulary lists. If similar amounts of learning are possible through TV viewing, the potential sharp increase in student motivation, and that's the key, right? You assign students to study the book, textbook, memorize vocabulary. Some do, some don't. It's hard work for everybody. But if they can learn a similar amount from TV, which they love, motivation levels will skyrocket. Okay, should, should make it something we need to study and consider closely. So Stuart Webb, as I mentioned, perhaps academia's top authority on television and language learning, explores this in his now classic article, Extensive Viewing. So extensive, lots. Language learning through watching television. And his findings may change the minds of many regarding the usefulness of entertainment television viewing and language learning. In the remainder of this paper, I'll examine some of the research in the field and give an example from my own teaching of what I do. Okay, so one of the great advances in 21st century language teaching comes from the increased use of language corpuses, which give educators the ability to determine and focus on the teaching of more frequently used words and collocations rather than push students to memorize vocabulary and patterns which they're doomed to decay from memory and be forgotten due to the unlikelihood learners will encounter them again soon enough to reinforce them, if indeed they are ever encountered again. And that's the problem we all face as, as language teachers. So often we're teaching more difficult things that as students read and do things on their own, those words or phrases, they may never recur again, maybe in their whole life. They have to be used enough to make it worthwhile for lower level or medium level students to try to learn. Now in 2009, Webb and Rogers did an analysis of over a quarter of a million words from 88 different English language television programs and found that knowledge of the most frequent 3,000 word families plus proper nouns and marginal words provided 95.45% of the coverage. In other words, most. So from this body of 3,000, that's where 95% of the stuff comes from. In the end, the results showed that there were relatively few encounters with low frequency vocabulary. And if learners watched at least an hour of television a day, there's a potential for significant incidental vocabulary learning. So for high level students ma majoring in, in, in English literature, say, and they're, they're reading uh, really difficult abstract theoretical things and studying Hamlet, this probably won't be useful for them. But for most undergraduate students or high school or elementary school, this is a great system because they're going to get everyday vocabulary, the common things thrown at them again and again so that they can keep working on it, improving and develop a natural understanding of it. Okay, now they come back to this line that was in here, incidental vocabulary learning. Uh, this should stand out, this is a key point. What this refers to is that all of us involved in language learning dream of, okay, uh, whether you're a student or a teacher, 
the natural absorption of the meaning of new words while only focusing on understanding and enjoying the story and not thinking about studying at all. This is the way we learned our mother tongues. You learned your language this way. I, you didn't have to study grammar to learn it. You just heard it. You watch stories, movies, TV show. Your mother talked to you and, and you're learning. And saying the same thing can happen with this through TV. But the key is extensive watching. You got to watch a lot. Okay. Uh, although in a moment we'll look at the use of subtitles when viewing, the first aspect of the right conditions for this is merely that the student watch and listen to the television program while it's playing. As Webb and Nation point out in their excellent How Vocabulary is Learned in the Oxford Teacher's Handbook series, good series, finding ways to encounter the target language outside the classroom is arguably the most important vocabulary learning strategy. This should be obvious, but sadly is not. Okay, and so what does this mean? Uh, students usually, they study English in the class. You give them homework, they do that. They don't study very much outside of that, often. Uh, but the more they're encountering, and it doesn't have to be English, of course, if they're studying Spanish or Swahili or Arabic, the same principles apply. The more they're encountering that language, the more they're going to be learning. If it's only a little bit each week, class time and some homework, and maybe they're trying to read a little bit, that's the only amount they'll get. But if they watch three or four hours of TV because they love the, the shows, you know, that'll be 20 hours a week of this language pouring in. Of course, they're not going to absorb all of it, but they'll be getting some the whole time. Okay. Uh, so an inline article, so this is some examples of how these things work out. Webb and Peters, so Webb with yet another co-author, make this explicit. We tend to make very small gains through encountering input, but these gains can become meaningful as they accumulate through encountering more and more input. This means that we learn very little through watching TV for an hour, but can make great gains through viewing a large amount of television. Uh, for second language learning, binge watching programs is a good thing. And that's kind of my theme here. Uh, binge watching we usually think of as kind of a waste of time, especially if you're a student who's supposed to be learning something. But for language, it can be great. Okay, for this to happen, students need to find programs they'll love, characters that speak a lot, and watch these programs regularly. Not primarily in study mode, just to learn, but rather in enjoyment mode, uh, with learning only vaguely somewhere in the back of their minds. This is one of the places where common anecdotal stories of learning overlap with academic study. So for example, in a CNN article, a University of Oregon linguistics professor points out that stories of immigrants to the U.S., including many famous athletes, learning English through television watching are hugely common. She refers to baseball players who developed relatively fluent English by watching programs like Friends obsessively. Along the same lines, in the same article, the Dean of Language Schools from Middlebury College in Vermont refers to Chinese and American young people, and quote, who grew up watching Jan Japanese anime without having any formal training in Japanese and developed quite reasonable comprehension. So they're just crazy about anime, watch it all the time, and learn some Japanese. Okay, similarly, Thomas Cox points out that watching TV and movies to learn a language helps improve learners' ear better than most language learning curriculums. That was a quote. And here's why. Because foreign language teachers often do much of their instruction in L1, in the first native language, rather than L2. I teach in Japan. I used to teach in Taiwan and Korea. That was almost always the case. Uh, the teachers just spoke in the local language and then dropped a little English in here and there. Okay, but when they're watching TV, it's English pouring in. Also, even when I teach the students, I don't speak very good Japanese or, or, or Chinese or Korean. I'm using English, but I slow down and simplify the way I talk to make sure students understand. But when they're watching TV, it's full on. You know, it's, it's made for native speakers, so it's fast. Of course, it's going to be hard for them to, to follow at first, but they're really going to be able to learn a lot, okay? As they pick it up, they get better. It's fantastic ear training. Now, the key to helping them with this, of course, is subtitles. And when you talk about subtitles, the big question comes up, which kind of subtitles? Should they use their own language subtitles, 
or the target language, what, what the people are speaking subtitles. If they're watching Friends, should it be English subtitles or Japanese subtitles, for example. Uh, the interesting point is, it doesn't matter that much. Either kind of subtitles, okay. But matching the language, the English subtitles with English speaking, for example, is better. Uh, but not that much better. Both are all right. All right? If, they're, if they're really paying attention into it and... Uh, trying to follow what they're saying okay all right there is more of this but uh time is flying let me jump to a basic way you can use this in your classroom find a program you like okay first uh you you have to get a script for it somehow there's two ways you can find an online script that's like a shooting script and it'll tell who's talking and where they are etc that's the best Second, you can download just the subtitle script. It just has the words. You'll have to type in a lot to say who's talking each time and break them into the chunks of dialogue from the program uh, and maybe tell when the scene changed, where they are, some basic information. That adds some extra work for you as the teacher. Second, after you have this, go through it. Pick out some of the key or more difficult vocabulary words, good idioms, expression, slang that you want the students to learn, make a list, okay? Uh, define the difficult words. You can maybe do it in the, in, the tar in the student's own language too. Tell them what it means, if that'll help. And before you show the program, like the week before, give it to the students, ask them to study that. Now, some will, some won't. A couple ways to help them do it is tell them there'll be a quiz. That will often inspire them. Second thing you do is do a game with it in class. And one I really like is have the students, put the students in groups of a few, five, six, seven, eight, nine students, into teams, actually. You give them some time as a team to study the vocabulary. And then when I have each team go one at, by, at, at a time up to the front, and I'll show one vocabulary word to one student. No one else can see it. They can't say the word, but they have to explain what it means until someone on their team can say the word. Okay, so they have to speak only in English. They can't say the word. And you time it. You give them like 2.5 minutes, 3 minutes for each team. So it becomes kind of exciting. Once they get it, they run to the back of the line. The next person, you show them a word, and they go. So it's, it's actually pretty fun. And if students are competitive at all, they'll really get into it. Okay, so this practices, rehearses the words. Uh, they speak it. They think about the meanings. Then you show the show, the program. But only about five minutes to show. Stop. Then you give out the scripts. You have students in groups, not just, uh, you know, reading to themselves. In groups of three, four, five students, read through a chunk of the script and uh, ask questions what they don't understand. And then I like to have students read their section out to the rest of the class. And I'll stop fix pronunciation, etc., or explain things I'm worried students won't understand, okay? After this, I gen generally have some discussion questions where I have them in groups and talk about kind of deeper issues and topics within the shows, okay? Anyway, I hope you find this useful, interesting. Uh, if you want to know more, please look at my paper, okay? All right, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye.